Today I want to speak to you on the subject of what is a real Christian. What is a real Christian? Now, obviously this is a Bible college and accredited seminary and we're raising up an army of individuals who feel the call of God in, in various capacities and some of you are still waiting upon God for specific direction and, and working through that process and that's all right. That's a part of the process. But let me say something very definitive. You will never be a quality ministry if you are not a quality Christian. Your ministry will ride in the wake of your Christian character and development. By the way, so excited to see uh, all of the note-taking. I, uh, and even those of you that are watching on social media and YouTube, listening to our podcast channel, wherever you may be, I ask this of all of our audiences, not just here at the Bible College as president. When I speak, bring a Bible, bring a way of taking notes, and bring a highlighter. Uh, before you graduate from these sacred halls, I want your Bible to be well-worn and well-marked. And we'll be going through some of the great passages and classic passages of Scripture that pertain to various doctrines. Of course, let me carefully define all of the Bible from the first word in Genesis to the last word in the book of Revelation. All of it is equally anointed, equally inspired, equally infallible, equally relevant. But there are some passages that traditionally have been called classic, and they are important. And I think perhaps, at least in the Western culture, that's because of how they so easily translate into our lives. I think today's passage will, will be that. 2 Corinthians 13, beginning to read at verse 1, reading down through verse 14. Again, the words of Paul. This is the third time I am coming to visit you, and as the scriptures say, the facts of every case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I have already warned those who had been sinning when I was there on my second visit. Now I again warn them and all others, just as I did before, that next time, I will not spare them. I will give you all the proof you want that Christ speaks through me. Christ is not weak when he deals with you. He is powerful among you. Although he was crucified in weakness, he now lives by the power of God. We too are weak just as Christ was, but when we deal with you, we will be alive with him and we'll have God's power. Now, if you would, run a highlighter through verse 5. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. That's one of my life scriptures. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. As you test yourselves, I hope you will recognize that we have not failed the test of apostolic authority. Let me just pause right there. Run a highlighter through authority. I think you will find in your ongoing development in ministry that there will be unlimited preaching, teaching, authorship, articles, etc. on the anointing, the anointing in ministry, how to have an ever-increasing anointing. 
we have done a fairly good job of putting a very bright spotlight upon anointing. Let me give you a gold nugget here. Your anointing will never rise above your authority. Your anointing will never rise above your authority. It's your authority, and it's not the authority of dictatorship. It's not the authority of a carnal imposing of your will. It's an authority that is given to you by God in direct parallel to your knowledge of his word, to your integrity in life, to your willingness to live Christ-like in all matters, to be sure you wake up each day with holy hands and a pure heart, and to do your calling with the diligence and the excellence that Christ is worthy of. Your authority grows by those biblical apostolic criteria. And as your authority grows, your anointing walks right behind it. So let me give you that gold nugget again. Your anointing will never be greater than your authority. People who walk in true anointing don't have to demand authority. They just carry it. It will be a mantle given to you by God based upon your commitment to him, his word, his covenant, his precepts, and his guidance. And if you walk in that humility before God, he will mantle you with a strength that's not your own. He will mantle you with an authority that is not your own. You can't demand authority from people. God will mantle you with it. As surely as he mantles you with a divine call, he will mantle you with an authority to execute that call. And your anointing will never rise higher than your authority. So don't make the mistake that a lot of Western Christians do. I believe global Christians do. They put a real strong emphasis, and again, I'm not demeaning it, how we cherish and pray for the anointing. But so many put a bright spotlight on the anointing with no understanding of the authority. And if you're not walking in the authority that God has mantled you in, your anointing will suffer in the aftermath. And Paul made that clear. As you test, as you examine yourselves, I hope you will recognize that we have not failed the test of apostolic authority. That probably would make a great future chapel, apostolic authority. Verse 7, we pray to God that you will not do what is wrong by refusing our correction. I hope we won't need to demonstrate our authority when we arrive. Pause again. There's proof of an authority that's different from secular authority. The authority of God that you're mantled with doesn't need you to prove it. It's just there. And it will be recognized the stronger it becomes without you being self-promotional in that apostolic authority. Do the right thing before we come, even if that makes it look like we have failed to demonstrate our authority. For we cannot oppose the truth, but must always stand for the truth. We are glad to seem weak if it helps show that you are actually strong. We pray that you will become mature. I am writing this to you before I come, hoping that I won't need to deal severely with you when I do come, for I want to use the authority the Lord has given me to strengthen you. Pause again. Biblical, godly authority is not used for dictatorship and domination. It is used to strengthen the work of God and the people of God. Can I hear a good North Point amen? I want you to use the authority the Lord has given me to strengthen you, not to tear you down. Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful, grow to maturity, encourage each other, live in harmony and peace. Then the God of love and peace will be with you. 
Greet each other with a sacred kiss. Now, that's in the Bible, but we will monitor, monitor that carefully here at North Point. All of God's people here send you their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray. Father, as we examine the scriptures and as Paul wrote, as we examine ourselves, we once again humble our hearts in your holy presence. Everything we have, everything we ever hope to be, we owe it all to you and we give you praise and honor and glory. We love you. I love you, Heavenly Father, and I pray that these attributes that Paul outlined as he was concluding this particular passage would be all over this campus, all over our students, all over our faculty and classrooms. May everything we do be pleasing in the eyes of God. We thank you in advance for miraculous victory in this new year. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. I said it before and I want to say it again. We cannot teach you how to be productive ministers if we fail to teach you how to be productive Christians. They are inseparable. They're like Siamese twins. It is impossible to separate the character of your Christianity and the character of your ministry. So I know I date myself when I bring up one of the greatest football coaches in the history of the NFL. But Google it if it is not a name you're familiar with. His name was Vince Lombardi. Now we have people from Wisconsin in the house. And if you're from Wisconsin and you don't know the name Vince Lombardi, we're going to have to ask you to leave the room. Vince Lombardi was considered one of the greatest football coaches in history, and I'm not here to give glory to Vince Lombardi, but I do want to point something out that was very unique about his coaching, and especially at the beginning of every new season, because we're, in my eyes as a president, it just seems like this is only my second semester, but it's almost like a brand new season, maybe like athletes have. There's just something about a new semester that gives you that fresh opportunity and fresh hope and fresh goals and fresh commitments. Every season, Vince Lombardi brought all of his team together, both veterans and rookies, and he spent the entire first session dealing with one single focus. And do you know what that was? What is a football? And he would hold, back in those days, the footballs were made by a company and they were called the Duke, D-U-K-E. And uh, they had no white stripes on them like many of our footballs today. They were not made out of cowhide. They were made out of pigskin. And he literally held up a football and went into an intense all-day teaching on what is a football talked about how it was made. He talked about how the leather was made. He taught them the difference between chromium tanning and vegetable tanning. He taught them the difference of stitches, the stitching pattern. He talked about the inflation. He talked about the aerodynamics. He talked about how to hold it. He talked about how to pass it. He talked about how to hold it in a way where the percentages were for you and not fumbling. And he spent this entire meticulous in-depth session on what is a football. And I thought of that as I was praying for you during my time of fasting and I'm speaking to you what I feel like one of the things and I have never heard the audible voice of God in all of my years of serving the Lord. I, I always as a young preacher's kid growing up in church just kind of was in awe of all of the people in church that God seemed to speak to them every single day about every single decision in life. And the Lord, you know, you'd have testimony services. You know, the Lord spoke to me. And, you know, by the time I was 12 or 13, I thought God was ticked off with me. 
I thought, wow, he speaks to, you know, these people in my dad's church every single day of their life and all of these details. And, you know, I'm 13 years old and read my Bible and pray. And he hadn't said boo to me. <laughs> but the Bible says my sheep know my voice. And as I began to mature in my faith, I began to understand that the voice of the Lord is rarely audible. And I, again, you know, all of these people that God speaks to them from the time they get up to the time they go to bed and sends three angels with scrolls to their hotel rooms and, and they go to heaven and come back. And, you know, I don't want to infer that they're fake. <laughs> but there is a lot of abuse that goes on in that realm, if we'd be honest. So if you have never heard the audible voice of God, let me encourage you. He speaks to the Spirit. And everything that God speaks will always be in complete agreement with this. You will never know the spoken voice of God. Write this down. You will never know the spoken voice of God better than you know the written word of God. So if you want to hone in on how does God speak to me in clear direction, counsel, and guidance, that runs in complete parallel with your diligence to know his word. Because God will never give you a revelation that betrays the Bible. God will never give you a personal word that cannot be propped up by the context of Scripture. God will never speak to you in a way that is contrary to this sacred book. Can I hear a good amen? You will never know the audible voice of God, the spoken word of God, the spirit voice of God, any better than you know the Bible. And so when I say I felt like God spoke to me certain things in my spirit because, you know, I... Through the years, through uh, dedicated fasting and prayer, sought God for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that God can give words of knowledge that are very specific. I, I spoke to a woman in a, in a word of knowledge that uh, was very specific. You know, the Lord speaking to my heart, uh, do you trust me enough to share? Uh, yes. Uh, does your husband own a trucking business? Yes. Did he recently start uh, a new route into the Midwest? Yes. Uh, does he normally never do long-haul trucking? Does he always have his employees do long-haul trucking? Yes. Did he recently tell you that he's not going to be home for Thanksgiving? Yes. Now, did I have all of that up front when I began to operate in that word of knowledge? No. The only thing I had was the Lord at the altars pulling this particular lady out and giving me just the first part of that word of knowledge. But as I began to deliver that word of knowledge by faith, the rest of it, just the same knowledge of God that came from that word of knowledge began to unfold. And it got more detailed than that, but I don't feel led to tell you the rest of that because it was not a good word. Long story short, don't miss this. You need to, not now, not when you start ministry, when you become a Christian, you need to prioritize learning the Bible and learning the voice of God to your spirit. Because the greatest things that will happen both in life and in ministry are going to happen by the voice of God's counsel and guidance, and you need to trust that. You need to learn that. Now, it's going to take time. That's why I always tell young Christians, follow your peace. But that was something in fasting and prayer that just came out of nowhere. You will not be able to lead them into successful ministry if you do not, first of all, lead them into real Christianity. Your first calling is not your ministry. Your first calling is Christ-likeness. John chapter 3, verse 30, the Bible says, He must increase, I must decrease. 
So let this at the beginning of this new semester be my Vince Lombardi, what is a football? We're not playing for the NFL. We're the chosen of the Most High God. What is a real Christian? Reading a Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Praying doesn't make you a Christian. By and large, the Muslims outpray the dedicated Christians of the West. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Singing Christian songs does not make you a Christian. Being involved in Christian ministry does not in and of itself make you a Christian. Trust me, I've met a lot of backslidden people in full-time ministry in churches. And coming in as a guest in a handful of days, knowing that there were people on that staff that were called and knowing that there were people on that staff that I knew in my spirit were simply hirelings. I oftentimes say as an evangelist working with pastors and churches about the greatest test for me in evaluating a pastor, and it's not spiritual at all. And it took decades to figure it out. But you know what I figured out after several decades of being around preachers? How they treated wait staff at lunch on Sunday afternoon was one of the best indicators as to the character of their Christianity. Because godly people walk in humility not just on Sunday. They walk in humility all the time. Godly people make every effort to treat people with grace, both in the fellowship of faith and the unsaved world in which we're trying to reach. Godly people care about people, both people in the fellowship of faith and people that we're trying to reach. And I hope you never meet, but sadly they exist, individuals who when they walk onto the platform, it's almost like a switch is flipped and they become a personality and a persona and a force in the sacred desk that is completely different from the person outside of the pulpit Monday through Friday in day-to-day -day life. You must at all costs avoid that. When you pray and develop your Christian character and your Christian disciplines and your Christian formation, there should be a consistency about your character that is unchangeable. Even as Jesus was unchangeable, we should seek to be like Christ and not have different flavors for different environments. We need to be real. And let me help you with something. You should never pray, Lord, make my fire for God be a great fire. Let it be a bonfire. Let it blaze around the world. That should not really be your prayer. Your prayer should not be about the size of your fire. Your prayer should be about the reality of your fire. Father, whatever my fire is, make it real fire. Because you're not in charge of your promotion. It's the reality of Christ in you and your humility and your Christian character that leads the way. Let me close with four very practical precepts of what a real Christian is. Because again, if you're going to have a successful ministry, you must be a successful Christian. I could tell you prominent people in my class that were friends on fire in leadership voted in in positions as class leaders that today aren't even serving the Lord. You must never allow your commitment to Christ to be subservient to your ministry. You must always keep your ministry subservient to your Christian walk. Four pillars of real Christianity. Number one, read your Bible. John 8, 31, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. Jesus said this. 
The president didn't say it. Jesus said it. Here, Jesus said, is how I'll know. Here is the evidence that substantiates that you're really a Christian. You continue in my word. Acts 17, 11, the Bible said, And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. Run a highlighter through this. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. It almost conveys, in fact, I believe in the King James, if memory serves me right, it's translated, the Christians at Thessalonica were more noble. Now pause for a moment and let's dissect this. Here is the Holy Spirit through the inspired word of God, comparing two churches, two groups of Christians, and basically saying one had a higher standard. And what was the higher standard that the Holy Spirit placed in the Bible? Their diligence to search the scriptures daily. Real Christians read their Bibles Every day. Now, I'm not going to be legalistic and say if, you know, you miss one day or you had a flight or you got caught in a snowstorm and sat on the side of the road trying to survive and, and keep your kids warm. And you know, I'm not going to be legalistic about that. I'm talking about an overall discipline. There's time every day for the real Christian to be found in the Bible. Your life, your ministry, your health, your prosperity, your favor, everything in the covenant of God rises and falls based upon how closely you are tied to the covenants of God and the precepts of God. Psalm 119.11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You can't live holy in your own strength. You can't live holy in your own power. You can't overcome your past through disciplines and encouragement and self-help and books written by psychiatrists. You must have the supernatural power of the Word of God and the fire of the Holy Ghost to get up every day and to live holy because the Bible makes you holy. Some of you, if you're going to put the past in the rearview mirror once and for all, God already has. But the problem we have in raw humanity is we can forgive people, but we can't forget. We'd like to, but we can't. You remember what people said to you. You remember what people did to you. You remember people you fell with. You remember past history. And you should try to get it under the blood. You should ask God to wash mind, body, and spirit every day and cleanse you and detach that from you. But the human memory is a two-edged sword. You must every day as a Christian realize my ability to live like Jesus is directly knit to my intimacy with the Bible. The Bible said the Berean Christians were in business in the Bible every day. How many days a week is the enemy of your soul in business? Seven days a week. Before I get to the last few, I actually have two Bibles in my ministry. This Bible is a Bible that I preach out of. It's one of multiple Bibles that I study out of. But early on in my life and early on in my ministry after graduating from Zion in 1979, as an evangelist, I had to preach a lot. And I've never been one of these evangelists that carried five sermons year to year. To this day, I still try to discipline myself and, and rarely uh, waver from this. To this day, I still try to write one sermon every single week. 
I don't know if this will surprise you or not, but probably 90% of the sermons that I have written I have never preached. But I did that as an evangelist because as a young evangelist, I used to hear pastors at fellowship meetings talk about evangelists that had three sermons. And, you know, it was almost like derogatory and making fun of us that were called into evangelism. Yeah, I've had him three years, and all three years I had him, he preached the same sermons. Well, that is a fault. That is proof of total lack of scholarship, commitment to excellence and calling and diligence in the things of the Scripture. I, I'll openly admit that. But I purposed in my heart, I'm going to discipline myself to be in the Word, to formulate, to dissect, to be a part of both analysis and synthesis when it comes to my integrity in the Bible. And I carry that habit to this day. Now, uh, social media in recent years has forced me to escalate that process. <laughs> but I will tell you this. Your ministry will never rise higher than your commitment to the Bible. And it might be a good idea, I pass this on to you as, as a father in the faith. Get two Bibles. One is for preaching. Because as an early evangelist, I found myself, every time I picked up a Bible, I felt this pressure. I, I need to have new material. I need to have new sermons. I need to hear from God. I need to deepen my doctrine, et cetera, et cetera. And I felt this pressure brought on by public speaking. So early on in my ministry, I believe the Lord gave me the idea. I'm not going to take credit for it. I got a devotional Bible. And when I picked up, like for the Bible I currently hold in my hand, usually when I pick this Bible up, I'm preparing to speak to you. Or I'm preparing to speak in a lost lamb crusade. Or I'm seeking the scriptures for the mind and the word of God for public ministry. But there's another Bible that I have, and I lay this one down. In the early days when I traveled, this Bible, not this particular one, I've worn a few out, as you might imagine, in several decades, but this Bible went on the desk at the hotel or wherever I was staying where there was my place of study. This one went on my place of study. The other Bible, I got into the habit of making my bed every morning, which my mother gave us no option in in our household growing up. Your bed had to be made every morning before you went to school. And I started that as a kid with my devotional Bible. And then I decided I'm going to carry that habit I had as a child into my ministry. Because as a child growing up, I wanted to be a real Christian. And I, I began to, through various preaching and guests and missionaries and evangelists and my own father's ministry, my mother... I realized, hey, I'm not reading my Bible very, very consistently. And so I asked the Lord to help me with that. I remember, I don't know, 11, 12, 13. And the Lord gave me an idea. When you make your bed in the morning, take your Bible and put it on your pillow. And make a vow to me never to go to bed at night without reading your Bible. So that Bible was laying on my pillow as a child every day that if in all of my activities and sports or practices or, you know, backyard football games with my brothers and the neighbors, whatever it was, kids are kids. And oftentimes I'd get to the end of the day and that Bible was there untouched. I didn't go to bed without reading as a kid the first habit. I still remember it. Five Psalms and one proverb. That was my minimal requirement. That's good advice for ministry. Maybe get two Bibles. Have one that is your calling to deliver the word of God to those he calls you to minister to and to preach. But be sure you keep one that has nothing to do with your work for God. Be sure you have one that's dedicated to your walk with God. And I'm not giving you a a legalistic requirement. I can't back this up with scripture. But I think it was something practical that helped me in ministry that will help you. Have a Bible for your work for God. Have a separate Bible for your walk with God. And approach it that way. These last few I'll go through quickly. We're talking about what is a real Christian. And we're talking about the real pillars of what real Christianity is. Number one, read your Bible every day. Number two, pray every day. 
As a child, one of my favorite, of course, I just mentioned to you that I'd try to read five chapters out of Psalms and one chapter out of Proverbs. It took me through those books each month. It's always a good idea. I don't care where you're at in life. If you're a Christian, whether you're students sitting here in this chapel called by God preparing for ministry or you're watching online from one of multiple nations around the world, if you're a real Christian, this is a great passage of Scripture. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Men ought always to pray, Jesus said. The Proverbs said, in all of your ways acknowledge me. God said, talk to me about everything. Jesus said in the New Testament, men ought always to pray. And women, that word men in the original text is generic. It means both male and female. I think most of you, I hope at this point, understand that not only in the translation of the Bible, but what was uh, authorship and scholarship and sciences and history and, and literature for many cultures, everything was written in the masculine. But ladies... This applies to you just as much as it applies to every man here. Men and women of God must always pray and not faint. Now this is going to sound harsh and face value it is. But listen carefully. A Christian who does not have a consistent daily life in prayer exhibits the greatest arrogance in the face of God. I'm not talking about ministers. As ministers, everything is heightened. You know the Bible teaches that all ministry will face double judgment. You're not going to face in eternity the same judgment as laity. When you lay your hands to the plow of ministry, there is a higher standard. That's why in Titus and Timothy, there's 19 moral qualifications for ministry separate from laity. And it's not pick your favorite dozen. God has high and holy standards for ministry. And if Christians were given the teachings and the precepts of the value and the potency and the privilege of prayer, how much more was, must we who are in ministry be devoted to prayer. I'm sure there's more uh, than I'm going to mention, but one of my uh, dear friends on this earth, his name is Pastor Daniel Bracken. He may be listening to this message uh, as I speak. His wife is Karen. Uh, they have established one of the greatest churches in the state of Alaska. And God is using them in a powerful way, and I'm happy to say that they are also North Point Bible College and Seminary students online as John and Anna Duke from Alaska through the leadership of Pastor Bracken are now following in that path and are now students at North Point Bible College and Seminary. But the church that he belongs to, the patriarch of that fellowship and network of churches, his name is Dr. Morocco and he uh, is a spiritual mentor in my life. As a matter of fact, some time ago, uh, a dear spiritual mentor, and I only have a holy handful that I've ever asked to, uh, to speak to me in that uh, regard, uh, went home to be with the Lord, and his name was Dr. Benjamin Crandall. He was a former president of this school and contributed much to this school. Recently went home to be with the Lord, but in the last few years of Dr. Crandall's life, uh, I couldn't call him anymore because of age and because of hearing issues. Uh, cell phones were very difficult for him uh, to have conversations. And so my conversations uh, began to dwindle down to the several times a year that I would go to see him in person. But the Lord gave me a heads up just like a couple of years ago when it became apparent that he would be a spiritual father of great respect and great honor until his homegoing. 
But the Lord began to speak to my heart. He no longer has the capacity because of his age, late 90s, to be what he used to be when you were a young man. I want you to begin to pray and seek my face for someone to take his place. Every real man of God, every real woman of God should have an elder above them that they answer to. That may not always be your credentials. And I'm not in any way demeaning that. I'm just saying that superintendents of denominations are not going to be afforded the intimacy with you that a spiritual father or a spiritual mother may have. And I do believe that every minister should be accountable in credentialing. I think there needs to be a process of accountability. That will be for another discussion. But the Lord laid Dr. Morocco upon my heart. And I called him and uh, there was silence on the other end. And he said, I'm, I'm honored that you would even ask. And since then, we now have regular phone calls. And he is an elder in my life and an apostolic voice. And you need to pick someone who can equally and as quickly rebuke you as encourage you. You don't need somebody that's going to pat you on your back all the way to heaven. You need somebody that will kick your butt when you need it. It needs to be somebody that will say, hey, I've seen a trajectory over the last several months that concerns me. Can we talk about it? Thank you for all those amens. You need to be mature enough to have people in your life that can equip you and rebuke you. Very important. Because you don't see your trajectory like other people see trajectory. You won't see your trends like other people see your trends. It's like a baby that's born. If you put a baby that's born in front of a mirror and he sits in front of the mirror or she sits in front of their mirror the entire lifespan, they'll never see themselves grow an inch. They'll never see any change whatsoever from infancy till death because they're too close to the process. You need people who can see you growing outside of the mirror. Very important. Now, I mention his name because he's pioneered over a thousand churches. And uh, his church is in Hawaii. It's called King's Cathedral. You may have seen him recently on all of the major news outlets. He was the minister that was used as the liaison with the horrific fire and, and so forth. That's Dr. Morocco. But one of his churches is in Wasilla, Alaska. That's Pastor Daniel Bracken. Do you know what Pastor Morocco has every pastor at all of his churches do? You have to have prayer meeting at your church seven days a week. Some of them do it at 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, some of them do it at 6 o'clock in the morning. But he built a thousand churches with one major pillar. All of the men and women of God that I raise up must commit themselves to prayer. And that's why prayer and fasting go together in a sentence because they're, gross, they're both crucifixion, aren't they? They're both against the natural tendencies of your flesh. But when you go into ministry and you don't have a daily life in prayer and a humble life in prayer and an open life in prayer, and an intimacy in prayer. You basically are telling God, I don't need your counsel. I don't need your guidance. I don't need you. I don't need your favor. I have enough skill and enough gifting that I can do ministry without you. That's why I said at the beginning of this, prayerlessness is the greatest arrogance in ministry exhibited in the face of God. And I know you'd like to believe that everybody in ministry seeks God every day. But there are a lot of prayerless people in full-time ministry. Matthew 6.33, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. I mentioned it in chapel yesterday. When prayerless, unprepared ministers walk onto the platform, the Holy Spirit runs off. Always go into the sacred desk with the word of God well equipped.
Always go into the pulpit, not only with the word of God in your hand, but the fire of prayer ever in your spirit. Can I hear a good North Point amen? amen. Number three, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this. Attend a Bible-believing church with a godly pastor. That is a hallmark of biblical Christianity. You are called to be a part of the church. And until you are in full-time ministry, until you are required by financial contract to be at every service, that should not be up for debate. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now we know according to Colossians and other passages in the New Testament that there is no legalistic Sabbath. Every day belongs to the Lord. We don't attack people because they have services on Saturday or they have it on Sunday or the people that have it on Sunday are fighting on Facebook with the people that have it on Saturday. And uh, please don't enter into the shallow end of that gene pool in social media interactions. Every day belongs to God. But the Bible did give us a principle that one day out of the week belongs to God. I know this is Vince Lombardi holding up a football, but I'm going to say it again. Attend a Bible-believing church with a godly pastor. And if you are Pentecostal and hold to the full gospel message, you need to attend a church that supports your Pentecostal distinctives. I love brothers in Christ who may not believe in the evidence of speaking in tongues or reject the Holy Spirit altogether, and I'll have fellowship with them, but I would never attend their church. Attend a church that supports your infancy in development and convictions. We unashamedly here have said it. It's not my call. I hope I've made this clear. This institution has a 100-year unwavering track record to the book of Acts and to the Pentecostal distinctives. We believe in salvation for all. We believe in healing for all. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit and the evidence of speaking in tongues. We believe the Holy Spirit is working now just as he worked in the book of Acts. We believe Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we embrace and preach that within the motivation of holiness that we believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Go to a Bible-believing church that supports the full gospel and make sure there's a godly pastor because there's a difference between Bible-believing churches and godly pastors. I hope this will be taken with education in mind and not criticism. There are Bible-believing churches with proper doctrine pastored by individuals who are not fully surrendered to the development of the Great Commission. No criticism, just raw data. I'm a Clint Eastwood fan, I always tell people with me, you're going to get the good, the bad, and the ugly. I've preached long enough to tell you there are people in ministry that the only thing that matters to them is how many were in service Sunday morning and what was the offering. Is that too raw? Somebody needs to tell you. There are people in ministry that the only question that comes into board of directors meetings, how many attended and what was the offering? They just want to ensure that the church survives, pays its bills, and their future is secure. Please, Promise God in a private place of prayer that you'll never become that. Care about people. Care about the work of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things are added. Never allow temporary things on the agenda of board meetings that have replaced eternal matters. Know the purpose of the church. 
Know the purpose of the chief shepherd of the church. Know your calling. Respect your calling. Honor your calling. Excel at your calling. Make up your mind you're not going to be like everybody else. Thank God for pastors' conventions and seminars around the country where much can be learned. But please promise God that you're not going to go to ministers' conventions and church school seminars and walk out of some cookie mold as to how some person is going to make you what God can't make you. God can make you what no man can make you. God can do in you what no man can ever offer you. And none of that to invalidate the counsel of those that go on before us. There are things to be learned. But many people put their trust in temporary at the expense of eternal. Lastly, and I close with this, lead people to Jesus. Perhaps one of the greatest evidences of your true Christian character is do you care about other people? Because, for example... We can have our doctrine right on heaven and hell. But what does it matter if your doctrine on heaven and hell and eternity are impeccable, but you've never led anybody to Christ? You've proven that your doctrine got stuck here, and it never made it to here. And I'm not saying every person you meet in public, you have to grab them by the collars and put them on the ground, putting a knee in their chest and Listen, brother, I got something to share with you. When you die, you're going to fry. You're going to bake in the lake. If you don't turn, you're going to burn. Would you like to pray with me right now? But you know what you can do? When you go through the drive through at Dunkin' Donuts, you can tip the person and show grace. You can always tell people, thank you. May God bless you and your family. You can always put God consciousness. Never be embarrassed of God. Never be embarrassed of your Savior.